Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. It's a pleasure for me to give you an overview of the work that we are uh, doing in the Wadi Hajar site since 2011. And I would like first to thank warmly Laurent Coulon for welcoming me in this uh, Palace of Munira, uh, Khaled Hassan, Chloe Ragazzoli, and uh, Florence Albert that suggested uh, that I could present this project before you tonight. Uh, I will not try to be too long to avoid you to delay too much the, the garden party because we, have, we had a nice smell of food in the room a few minutes ago. So I, I will be quick to present, first of all, the archaeological uh, campaigns that's been made on the, uh, on the Wadi Ajar site since the beginning and the Babaharus archive that was found, found there, uh, which is in uh, connection with, what, uh, with the theme of those uh, days. The place of uh, Wadi Ajar lies on the coast of the Gulf of Suez it is the third arbor from the Pharaonic period that has been identified so far on the Red Sea. First of all, the place of Persagawasi was discovered in the 1970s by uh, the uh, Egyptian archaeologist Abdel Monem Sayed. Secondly, the place of Ainsurna is excavated by a joint team of the University of Ismailia and the IFAO since 2001, and uh, last of all, this place of Wadi El Jaf was rediscovered in 2011 and is now excavated by, uh, in the framework of a joint project of the French Institute of Archaeology, the University of Paris-Sorbonne, and the University for Asyut with my colleague uh, El Sayed Marfouz. This place of Wadi Al Jaf is in fact quite in front of the peninsula of Sinai and it was probably used mainly to go to Sinai during the Pharaonic period to fetch copper that was used by the workers, for example, to build the pyramids at the time of the very beginning of the fourth dynasty. To get to this Wadi Al Jaf place, the team had to go on the on the river upstream to go to the area of Medum, then to cross the desert to the place of Wadi El Jaf, and from this place of Wadi El Jaf, they were constructing boats, crossing the Red Sea, and going to Sinai. On the coast of Sinai, there is also a fortress that was made probably, built probably also at the very beginning of the fourth dynasty at El Marca and then they were going in the mining uh, country to fetch copper and turquoise, especially in the place of Wadi Mahara, where reliefs from the time of the fourth dynasty with names of Snefru and Rufru have been discovered a long time ago. Those places are used since a very long time. They were first seen by uh, British explorer whose name was John Garner Wilkinson at the beginning of the 19th century and rediscovered by French pilots, French boat pilots of the Suez Gulf during the 1915s. But in fact, the place was not at that time identified as an arbor. For there is a particularity of the place, the main place where remains could be observed is about five kilometers from the seashore and that's the reason why the previous travelers that have seen the place were not able to identify an arbor on the Red Sea shore. In fact, we have here a, a feature that is common to all the arbor on the Red Sea shore. We have different position on the coast and the main element is of course the water. We have water in this area. It is today included inside the monastery of uh, Abu Bolos. We have, we have a spring of uh, fresh water which is producing about four cubic meters of water every day. It is basically, most probably, the reason why the Egyptians from the uh, Pharaonic period selected this place. And the Pharaonic remains are spread in a very large distance from the bottom of the mountain, where we have caves and the seashore itself. Why do we have caves in a place like uh, Wadi El Jaf? 
We have about 30 caves on the place. And this is the main feature of those arbors on the Red Sea shore. They were meant to not to be occupied all the time. They were intermittent arbor. So they were bringing their, the, the boats from the Nile Valley to the Red Sea shore. They were using the boats at the time of the expedition. And at the end, they choose to leave the boats inside this cave. And this is basically the reason why we have caves on all those arbors of the Red Sea shore that have been so far identified. In Wadi El Jaf, we have a, a huge complex of caves. About 31 have been discovered. Some were completely closed at the time of the discovery, but most of them were still open to visitors. And we have excavated a first system of about 20 caves, and it remains about 10 caves to excavate completely. This is the way we can see those caves. They are very carefully closed with big blocks of limestone. Sometimes we have even the right wheel of wood that we are used to push the, uh, the block in the entrance of those caves. Of course, they had to close very carefully those caves because they were leaving very precious deposits inside, cedar wood, dismantled boats that were imported for the Lebanon, and so they wanted to be able to get it back when there will be another time on the Red Sea shore. This is what we have at the entrance of the cave, those big limestone blocks that are extracted in uh, uh, quarries not so far from the place. And uh, at the time of the use of this arbor, each time they were departing, they managed to close completely the caves and maybe they were also try trying to hidden them under sand. The place was not visible in between two expeditions of the, uh, of the uh, Egyptians. This is probably the reason why we have no rock inscription claiming the property of the king on the place. They have to be discreet. So we have many kinds of uh, inscription in the place, but not this kind of claimer of the past, no rock inscription, but we see that we have many other things on the place. This is the inside of the, those galleries. Some of them are up to uh, 35 meters long. They are very well made, more than two meters high, two meters large, and they were sometimes equipped with small uh, walls of dry stone to place the beams of boats that were stored inside. What we have seen inside those galleries, we have found, found pieces of boats, not necessarily the best ones, ropes, we have also clothes, all the material that was used during the expeditions. We also have big sets of storage jars that, was that were probably used to concentrate the water from the spring to allow the uh, teams to live on the place for a long time. And we could imagine that we had in this place of Wadi El Jaf probably five to six different expeditions, each time staying several months to pilot expedition on the Red Sea shore to go to Sinai and maybe to go further on the Red Sea. The other part of the place that we have, we have also camps in several positions in between the mountain and the sea. We have camps about 500 meters from the cave system. We have not yet excavated the system of camps. We have also a big stone building of about 60 meter long, 40 meter large. That's we excavated the three last years. It was completely filled up with sand and it was a long task. And we were really disabled at the end of this excavation because the place was quite intact but it was left without a single shell inside. It has been completely cleaned by the, Egy the Egyptian at the time of their last departure. So no material, no archaeological material at this level, but the building is really nice. But there is something which is interesting again, because we determine that uh, under this big building, we have the remains of a previous occupation 
uh, several different buildings that were erased and replaced by this building, building. We have not completely finished this excavation, but already we have plenty of material coming from these lower buildings. And those lower buildings are probably from the time of Snefru, because we have found so far several ceilings giving the name of the founder of the first dynasty. For example, we have uh, pottery, uh, we have ashes, we have vessels that are used to make, uh, uh, to make uh, bread, and we even have inscription. I will pay a word about that in a few minutes. And to finish with, we, are, we have also a uh, maritime installation nearby the seashore. We have a big jetty of about 200 meters long uh, from west to east and 200 meters long again from north to south. An uh, L-shaped jetty, which is probably one of the most ancient maritime harbor that we know today. We have here a nice view of this uh, jetty. The only time we have been able to see it out of the water, it didn't happen a second time. It was the very first year of excavation in 2011. And we have taken a kite view of it to show you in detail the structure, which is really impressive. And uh, the corner of the jetty itself, and inside the jetty, we have found about three, uh, 30 anchors for boats still laying at their original place with uh, pottery that are locally made and typically from the fourth dynasty. So it's clear that all the structure that we have, the camps, the caves and the arbor are strictly the same period and it seems that the place was only occupied during the three first reigns of the fourth dynasty. This is a jar that are still laying at the bottom of the arbor. And we managed to clean the landed part of this jetty, which appears to be a very nice, well-preserved structure and very well-constructed structure. And you have here the full uh, drawing of, uh, and section of this jetty at the end of its excavation in 2015. So this is a, uh, the map of the, of the arbor, and right now we have each year a team of Egyptian divers that are trying to find more information about the arbor itself by excavating the, uh, the uh, maritime part of this uh, jetty. And this year they have found remains of food and ropes and shells of pottery inside the basin of the arbor. So it's also really interesting and I think it will continue the next years. And nearby the arbor there were also uh, camps that were probably used uh, in close contact with the Zuti. And when we clean those two camps that you can see here with this uh, typically uh, comb-shaped uh, buildings, we had the surprise to find that in between the two buildings where was a deposit of about 100 anchors from the time of Khufu that were stored inside the building before being completely forgotten by the Egyptian. And on some of those anchors, it's possible to see the ropes that were, that were used to tie them and to use them. And they were, of course, they, they have been used because we can see shells and earthen's uh, parts still uh, yeah, adhering to the, to the stones in, on those anchors. So I jumped to the inscription, which is the main uh, point for the day, for today. And uh, I must say that we were really lucky in this place of Wadi Ajar because uh, usually inscriptions of the fourth dynasty are not so frequent, it's rather scarce, but in Wadi Ajar we have every kind of inscriptions. For example, in some of the gallery we have inscriptions that are probably linked to the expedition and uh, made by people wanting to uh, commemorate their venue on the place. For example, this nice uh, drawing of a small official whose name is a scribe of the Fayum Idu has been found inside gallery number one. And we so far I find I have found the remains of at least three other commemorative inscriptions inside galleries. 
unfortunately, it's most often very broken, but it exists even during the beginning of the fourth dynasty. We have also control marks that were placed on the big blocks of limestones that were used to close the caves. This is some kind of inscription that we have in Giza very frequently to name the teams that were involved in the work for the king. And so we have several, uh, several of those control marks in the blocks that are closing the caves. We have found about 50 of them so far. And we also like to play with the plugin this stretch as uh, most of uh, our, our colleagues in uh, at Noob and Wadi Amamat because it allows us to read more uh, clearly some inscriptions that were made with red ink at the time of the beginning of the fourth dynasty. Those inscriptions are naming teams. Those teams were involved in the management of the arbor and they are probably named after boats they were taking care of. In fact, this one is named The Followers of Rufu Brings Its Two Ladies. And my guess is that, in fact, we have here the name of a boat who, which has in its prow royal emblema like sna royal snakes. And it is probably confined but by another control marks that we have regularly on the place. Here you have the name of a team whose name is The Follower of Great is Its lion and the lion is in fact attached to a, a boat, a she boat, Depet, and uh, it's probably once again the depiction of a boat which is having a lion emblem of the king at its prow. We also have inscription of pottery. This pot, those pottery are locally made by the teams that are working in the harbor and those Jars, sometimes very well preserved. In this cave, we have found about 200, 200 of them, are quite systematically inscribed with the name of the team that were producing them. For example, here you have several different names of team. For example, here you have the team of those who are known of the double falcon of God, which is one of the names of Hufu. So you have a, name, uh, a team which is named after the king itself, himself. Here you have another uh, name of team, uh, which is probably the team that has the papyrus archives I will present in a few, uh, in a few minutes. We also have dozens of ceilings with name of Sefu and Hufu, naming official from the beginning of the fourth dynasty. We have an uh, inscription of, on the anchors that we have found nearby the sea. Here, for example, you have maybe a boat whose name is the one who rises the white crone, Kai Ejet, and it appears on several anchors uh, nearby the, the sea. We have also found in the intermediate building a lot of ostraca from the time of Snefru. Those ostraca are giving accounts in red and unit measure that were probably used to uh, measure corn. And I think that it was used as token to exchange for a ration of corn. And what is really interesting is that we have several uh, units of measure because maybe we are in a changing moment, we are passing from an uh, old measure for corn to a new one that uh, would be the measure Ekat, which is well known for the rest of the history of Egypt. We have also Ostraka, that's our naming teams, that were also uh, working in this camp, and sometimes also Ostraka giving names of people that were uh, among the people that were involved in the expedition. For example, here you have the name of the controller of the Aper team, whose name is probably Sha'a. And this year we found another uh, nice Ostrakon from the time of Nufu. I think it's uh, among the oldest uh, documents in hieratic script. And it reads the hunter Tehi. This name is literally the drunkard. I think it's a long tradition because I, I, I know in the south and, and southwestern France uh, many, uh, many uh, hunters that would deserve such a nickname again today. We have also uh, inscription on uh, copper tools. 
We have a description on clothes that we are finding regularly at the entrance of the caves. We have inscription on the piece of boats that we are finding inside the cave, probably means to identify those pieces of, of boats and to be allowed to reconstruct the boats themselves. To finish with, we have even inscription on horns of cattle. We don't know even what it was used for, but we have found hundreds of them. And many times we have uh, symbol signs that are indicating the, the that, that they are owned by, by section of teams, and we have also inscriptions on uh, stone tools. So we have quite all the kinds of uh, inscriptions that we could have in uh, this place of Wadi El Jaf. But of course, the most interesting, in fact, the most surprising, was to find papyri in this place. It was not expected because we are very far from the administrative centers of the time of the beginning of the fourth dynasty, but we have found very regularly fragments of papyri. We have found them, we found them mostly at the entrance of those caves, sometimes a few pieces of papyri, but in 2013, we were lucky to find in between those two big limestone blocks, a big deposit of an archive of papyri, of papyri that's counted more than 1,000 of fragments of papyri. And I think it's linked to at least 30 different rolls of papyri being the archives of one of those teams of workers that were currently working inside those, uh, this arbor. This is uh, one of those papyri at the time of discovery. It's still a little bit rolled, even if, it's, if it is most decayed. And at the end of the first campaign, we had about uh, 60 frames of glass with fragments of papyri. Uh, I think right now we have about 100 of them. And those papyri are of very different kinds of documents. Uh, in fact, this one is probably the most important because it gives us a precise datation. It is the end of the Rufus reign the year after the 13th census of the cattle, that would have been the last known year of this king, around year 26 or 27 of Rufu, and nearby uh, the date and the name of the king, the Horus Mejedu, you have here the name of the team that is the owner of the archive, and the team is the team name, the followers of Rufus Uverus is its proud. And this last name of teams is, in fact, explaining all the other names of teams that we have in Wadi El Jaf. And we have, in fact, a shortened version of this name of team in several, in hundreds of fragments of pottery that was found in the place. So it's clear that this team was at work in the place of Wadi El Jaf for a long time. They, they left their pottery and the LFOC at the last time, we don't know why, the papyrus archives at the entrance of, of one of the caves. We have several kinds of accounting documents. Some of them are written in hieroglyph. Uh, it is the case for this very nice accounting document that is probably uh, naming the Chenut department, the granary department, with uh, various kind of commodity you can recognize different kind of bread, uh, bread gawa, bread uh, shawut, which is uh, well known from the middle, New Kingdom, also New Kingdom uh, documentation. We have also dabu, fix. We have also kind of beer, serepet. So we have a huge uh, variety of food that is given to those workers. And we have also uh, documents that are accounting documents for various cereals. For example, this uh, big papyrus, it is about uh, 80 centimeters long, but I think we can reconstruct quite everything that was in it at first. Is giving an account, uh, accounting of uh, different kind of bread and cereals. And for at the, uh, uh, on the extern, extern part of the papyrus, you have the title, uh, Heseb and T, account of bread. And on the verso, you have the place where the commodity are coming from. Here, this is the gnome of the harpoon here. You have here 
the different variety of food which is uh, uh, registered here. You have wheat flour, barley, grain, and even dates that are present in this document. And it works quite the same way as papyri from the Abuzir uh, the temples are working two centuries later. You have in black, the, uh, in red, I'm sorry, the commodities that are supposed to be dis uh, de delivered to the workers. Uh, in the middle column, what has really been given to the workers and what is still expected is in red at the end of the three section column that you have here. And we can re realize that each time there is about one third of the food ration that is not delivered to the workers. And uh, we have also, this is another accounting document which is really interesting because here you could have something which could read Isege, literally, the place to sleep. That could be one of the camps that we have, in fact, on the place of Wadi al-Jarf. And what is really interesting is that we have the full datation, the month of Ahret here, and you have, once again, a very uh, various uh, list of uh, material and food. It begins with variety of bread, corn, and dates. But on the middle part of the document, you have the names of different copper tools that are used by boat makers during the old kingdom and the scenes that, that were uh, conserved in the, in the, in the tomb. So uh, we have probably something which is really linked to the daily life of the arbor of Wadi al -Jarf. But it's not all. We have also many different kinds of documents. We have, for example, here what I would call the first ID card of the world. It has been found in front of one of the caves. It's uh, written very huge hieroglyphic script that is probably meant to be recognized even by people that are not really able to read. And it is complete. It was not rolled, but probably fold in eight parts to be, uh, to be held with a rope under the neck. And it's uh, just identifying one guy, which is great of the palanquin. He is also the controller of the dwarves of the, of the magazine of, of Lyman. He is also uh, the director of the necklaces stringer. So its presence, his presence is what you have. It's not so strange because he's involved in the jewelry making. And from what you have, you are going to Sinai to fetch turquoise. And this guy, this guy is really interesting because it's probably a dwarf. Uh, he's control of the dwarfs of the palace, and I suspect he is the immediate predecessor of the famous Seneb uh, dwarf that you have in the Museum of Cairo, uh, because uh, in fact this guy has probably been in charge during the reign of Khufu and uh, um, and Rejedef from the name of those uh, uh, children that, you, that appear under his leg, but from the archaeological context, the Irunifer that we have in the other papyrus is probably from the reign of Khufu. We have also strange documents we are not really identified right now. It's for the colleagues that are skeptical about the range of uh, um, writing material that we could find, but I suspect that we have here either a map is a, a, la, a list of uh, desertic countries because you have those names and each time you have this kind of uh, red dots at the bottom. It's, it can recall what appears in the papyrus of uh, geographical called papyrus of Turin. And I have still to work on this, uh, on this document because we have several fragments of it to, to gather to have a more precise idea of what it is. We even have probably letters Unfortunately, we have just the bottom of one of them. It's dealing with horsemen, sailors, uh, um, yeah, to sail on the water to accomplish the ritual. But it is written, and it's probably instruction or a letter that has survived, but only partially. And uh, to finish with, we have also different kinds of logs books. This one is very specific. You have here uh, just a small fragment of papyrus, but is regist registering several days. You have the same the sign for day each time here. And not all the columns are filled up, but each time they are filled up, we are indicating that a boat is landing. So we have what we could have in inside the boat, in fact, a real log for a sailor 
registering the movement of uh, a boat at that time. And we have also, in all those documents, accounting documents and logbooks, many new toponyms that are known from this documentation, also many new words, in fact, that are not present in the different uh, dictionary of Egyptian that we have. And to finish with, of course, what has uh, much uh, attracted the attention are the logbooks that we have found among this papyrus archive. I think we have about seven of them, and they are giving account of a full year of activity of a team of sailors and, work, uh, and workers. In fact, they are organized exactly the same way as the uh, accounting document that we have, with uh, a date on the upper part. Here you have the first month of the Achet season. On the second line you have uh, the, each day of the month which is uh, written here. And for each day you will have also two columns of hieratic scripts giving the daily accounts of the work of this team. So we can follow day by day the activity of this team of sailors. And we have several different missions all around the year. Uh, they are probably uh, during the July uh, and months of July of the year after the certain census of Rufu, opening seasonal canal, bringing lamps and blood from Tura to the pyramid of Giza. This is Papyrus A and B. But in the later time, they are probably also some doing something, building something in the delta, which is not so frequent because we have not so many information from the delta during the beginning of the fourth dynasty. And we have also uh, a long uh, document that is probably giving information about those teams attending the royal palace and several other administrative institutions in Giza. I will develop a little bit this point because it is not yet published. And to finish with, we even have a few fragments that give accounts of the work of the team a few months, a few weeks before their departure from the place of Wadi El Jaf, before they were just leaving the archives on the site. The papers A and B, I will be go, I will go very fast because it has been published by the French Institute two years ago. This is the most uh, famous part of those logbooks because uh, it's, it is uh, the best preserved at first, but it's also the part of the papyri that are speaking about the pyramid of Khufu and that are giving accounts of the work of the uh, sailors to bring the stones to the pyramid at the later stage of its building, most probably. Papyrus A is probably uh, giving information about, first of all, uh, very quick uh, travels between Tura and Giza, and the later part is probably devoted to uh, account, to, uh, to, uh, to account the opening of a seasonal canal that is probably nearby uh, the pyramid of, uh, of Giza. We have the mention of a dike, and uh, it, is, uh, it is said that we are uh, lifting, lifting the piles of the dike, probably to open the artificial basins that we had in front of the plateau of Giza. And what is really interesting is that to open seasonal canal at the time of the flood is something which is well known in Egypt, even in medieval and modern time, it's most probable that they use the same way to keep the water in basin at the time of the low, uh, of the low Niles. And what is really interesting also is that we have an idea of the topography of the wool area of Giza because those papyri are naming several artificial basins like Che Rufu, the lake of Rufu, and Roche Rufu, the entrance to the lake of Rufu, which are the place the boats are passing by to approach the Giza Plateau. And this reconstruction of the Giza Plateau fits very well with the work of Marc Lenaire, those last 20 years that he tried to reconstruct uh, the shapes of the artificial basin that were made at the foot of the pyramid and the papyri of Wadi al are giving a name to 
I gave him names to those uh, basins and lakes that were really present at the foot of the pyramids. Papyrus B uh, is just giving, and it's rather boring of course, uh, the two-way trips to go from Tura to Giza to fetch a block of limestone from Tura and, and to Giza. We can remark that there are two different quarries that are used by the, uh, by the Egyptian, Tara, Tura South and Tura North. And we have sometimes uh, special events that are, all, all, uh, that are some, sometimes also um, indicated by the document. For example, here, uh, this uh, Inspector Merer, who is probably the one who is writing day after day this, uh, uh, this logbook, is on his way to go back to Tura after having delivered stones to the pyramid and is probably taken by the boss to do uh, additional work, which is probably to track a fleet that is supposed to depart at that time. And uh, it is the occasion when we have a very famous character that appears in the documentation, is uh, the half-brother of King uh, Rufu, Or Aef, whose uh, very impressive statues, statue is kept in the Museum of Boston and is uh, there uh, indicated uh, as a prince, the director of the place of Rocher Rufu, the entrance to the lake of Rufu. Uh, and, uh, of course, it is probably at that time the main official which is in who is in charge of the building of the pyramid at the very end of the reign of Khufu. I will just play a word on the two other papyri that I have that are probably linked to the same team. We have papyri C. It's just small fragments and they are very repetitive. And we can see here that they are building something. They are building, they are compacting the stone here for a construction, a building which, which, which is named a double jaja. Jaja naming a K, probably something like an esplanade or a K. I suspect that in fact they are working to build something like an arbor. And what we have also is the indication that we are in places that are clearly named Rou, the big mouse of the marshland, Rou Ideu, and we have, we have also another name which is Ma'a, Rou Ma'a, the straw, the shrew mouse. It's probably both linked to opening of the branch of the Nile, and what is really interesting is that from the rest of the Egyptological documentation, we can place clearly those places of Rohu and Roma'a on the 12th nome of Lower Egypt. Uh, that's it, in a place where probably the seashore was at the time of the beginning of the Old Kingdom. So we have probably, through those information, the building of an arbor. We know that's in the time of Khufu, they managed to have a, an artificial arbor built on the Red Sea. Maybe the equivalent structure was built also nearby the Mediterranean Sea at the same time. And we have also, through the same papyrus sea, the mechanism of the, the work, because we can see that there is a Ut Khufu, a foundation of Khufu, that is used to fetch the stone that is used to, to build the Jaja. And this Utrufu is also used to, to give the food to the workers that are involved in this work. So we have also the mechanism of the valorization of the delta that is well known for the beginning of the fourth dynasty through the big foundation of the king that we know from the reign of Snefru and Khufu especially. To finish with, and not to delay too much the current party, Papyrus D is a really fragmentary document. But we have about more than 100 fragments very well inscribed. And the chance was that those fragments were sometimes stuck together. So we had different layers of the same papyrus. That allowed me to reconstruct, to try an hypothetical reconstruction of this document. We have here not only a section of a team of 40 men, that was the case with this Inspector Merer, who is the owner of the other papyri. Here, everything is to the name of a scribe daddy, 
we seem to supervise the whole team and the different section of the team. Each team of work at that time is divided between the big one, the Asiatic one, the Prosper one, and the little one. We have four different sections of the team, and all the four sections appear in this last document, Papyrus D. What are they doing? They are most regularly linked to an institution which is the Are Roots, the portal. And we have here different tasks that are given to them. The, uh, for example, here you have uh, the scribe Dedi goes to a place we don't know, and the file Tau of the Asiatic spends the day on the portal. Here, the file the small spends the day on the portal, bring flour to cook the bread for the Lord. So they are involved in the domestic task. Here you have to bring the team Setepsa transport of people also. And sometimes we have also in this papyri, in all those papyri, indication in red. Each time it is in red, it is because we are doing something for the team. The rest is in black, but each time they are getting food, tissue, clothes, it's written in red. Here I suspect that they could have get something like uh, official document, official letter from the king in a place whose name is Oru Rufu, the place of May the King Rufu Live. And this is a tentative reconstruction of this papyrus. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, I had some luck because it was possible to, to connect several fragments together. And at the end, I can reconstruct a papyri of about, yeah, one meter seventy. I only have about 50% of the original document, but at least I have 90 of the logical mind that is behind the text. And for example, here I can reconstruct this to empty a boat, Enrufu. Enrufu is a place which is regularly named. The inspector Meher says to maybe Enrufu. Arrival of the Iwat boat, scribe Dedi goes to the granary, and uh, again, Enrufu. The file, the big one, spends the day at the portal of Enrufu. The big one spends the day at the portal of Enrufu, and in red, to give equipment to the inspector Merer. You can see the use of red ink and black ink in, this, uh, in these documents. The main place is Enrufu, but the problem is to know what it is exactly. It has different kind of writing. Sometimes it's just with the determinative of the building. Sometimes we have also the determinative of the town. So that different realities could be uh, defined by this word of Enrou Khoufou. But what is interesting is that we can have a, a list of the activities that are linked to this uh, place of Enrou Khoufou to attend the portal. At that time of the Old Kingdom, this, this word Arerut is mainly, from the evidence that we have, designating the entrance of the temple to bring fowl, flour to cook bread, to transport the team, but also to bring the natron, which is something that is involved in the cult, and to make the ritual is also made by this document. So I suggest that this place of Anhorufu, which is connected to other places, because we have in the document the name of the portal, Arerut, we have also the name of the Granari, Chenut, we have several mention of the residence, Renu, and we have to finish with the, more, the word for Seru archives. This documentation is even kind enough to give us the name of the place it was supposed to be stored. And I think the only place that would have all these functionalities is the Valley Temple of King Khufu, which is in connection with, uh, uh, with the river, and we know from the other times of Egypt that most often the royal palace was closely, very close to the Valley Temple and the archives were kept inside the Valley Temple. It's the reason why for the Abu Zia Papari, the only archives that we have are from temple where the Valley Temple was not built and so the archives were not spoiled by the water because the Valley Temple is not a proper place to keep archives for a long time. So anyway, what I suppose to finish with is uh, this kind of a construction. And uh, this is a suggestion of Mark Lenner. You could have in this documentation 
the place of uh, that should have been the domain of the dead king, which is opposite to the uh, place of Ahurufu, which would have been the domain of the living king, where you could find the valley temple, the royal palace, the archives, and all the institution, main institutions that are working at the time of the building of this pyramid of Khufu. To finish with just a word, because I'm not alone for this work in Wadi al Jaf, it's, uh, it's a work of a full team, and I have not spoken about only the papyri. I would like to, uh, to quote uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Grégory Marois and Séverine Marché, archaeologists that are leading the excavation uh, on this place. My colleague, uh, my Egyptian colleague, El Sayed Marfouz, Egyptologist at Asut University, and uh, also uh, my colleague Mohamed Abdel Negid, also archaeologist of the Ministry of Antiquity, which is involved, also was involved in this mission. Uh, Georges Castel, archaeologist uh, from the IFAO, Daniel Henné, topographer in the Maison de l'Orient et de la Méditerranée, and uh, many uh, students that were involved in the project since uh, 2001 and 2011, I'm sorry. And to finish with, I would like to thank also all the institutions that are giving us the money to work, because it's more and more difficult to get year after year. First of all, the French Institute, of course. The French Foreign Office is also giving us uh, money to work, the French CNRS. And we have also several private foundations, like AAL Foundation, Honor France Foundation, and several uh, French uh, French enterprise in Egypt, like Vinci and Collage Rice, and it's all owing to those uh, help, and to this help, that we are able to conduct these projects for the ninth campaign last March, April. Thank you very much for your attention.